<coughs> Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the regular meeting of the Portsmouth Planning Board for March 15th. <coughs> um, first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Approval of the minutes from both the February 1st and February 15th, 2000 Planning Board meetings. <coughs> Any comments on the minutes? No? Motion to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The chair votes aye. We'll now move into the public hearings. Item A, the Portsmouth Planning Board is conducting a public hearing to take public comment on proposed amendments to the city's 1995 zoning ordinance as amended. The amendments include changes and additions to the following sections. Chapter 10, section 10-102, definition, floor area ratio. Section 10-304A, business, table 10 dimensional requirements. And section 10-304, new ENF for central business A, district. Copies of the proposed amendments uh, were on file with the planning department office and were available for public inspection. I'm gonna turn this over to David. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, board members may recall that you did a work session on this, I believe on March 1st, and you favorably recommended this on to the council where this ordinance is actually going to be heard in the required public hearing at the city council this coming Monday. However, the council and the board agreed that they would do a sort of courtesy public hearing just to see if there was any issue that might be identified or could be brought to the board's attention so as appropriate we could advise the council in time for the second reading. Uh, Rick Tainer, the uh, board's consultant on the zoning ordinance is here and I would suggest that you invite him to give a brief overview of uh, the particulars to this amendment. Thank you. Um, this, again, was uh, in response to a proposal to, uh, initial proposal to just reduce building heights in the CBA district, and uh, there was a lot of discussion about what the ultimate intent of that proposal was, and, and there was a lot of concern about preserving open, uh, an open feeling, not feeling uh, too hemmed in by taller buildings on narrow streets, uh, and also trying to gain some, some useful open space and, and uh, more more amenities at the street level. And so we tried a number of different approaches to get to this and ended up with uh, this approach, which uh, does a number of things. First of all, it starts with uh, creating this definition of a floor area ratio, which is the ratio of the total floor area in the buildings on the lot to the area of the lot. And that's used later on. Um, and then we uh, add um, the, a uh, a couple of notes to the dimensional table. The first note, note E, uh, states that no portion of a building that is within 10 feet of a street line uh, can be higher than, than 40 feet. Uh, you, you know that the existing height um, limit in the CBA district is 50 feet, so this would uh, essentially create a step back. So if you got to, to above three to four stories, before you get to the full height that's allowed in the zoning district, you need to step the building back 10 feet, so it gives you a little bit more uh, light and air at the street level. Uh, that creates, when you think about it, uh, the, there's a, a typical right of way in most of the streets in the downtown of 40 feet. So this creates a one-to-one a one -one relationship between the height of buildings at the street edge and the width of the street, and that's generally accepted to be a, uh, a good ratio uh, to achieve in an urban environment that you get, get getting below uh, beyond that to, to a higher ratio of building height to street width uh, sometimes gives you a feeling of crowdedness. Then the second piece is using that floor area ratio requirement and it sets the, the, the floor area ratio at 3.5. So 3.5, the, 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 the total floor area of a building may be 3.5 times the total area of the lot uh, except under certain situations. and, and to tell you how, what that 3.5 means, we did an initial analysis. If you took your existing zoning regulations right now um, and you, you tried to come up with the implied FAR, it's about a 3.8. So this is a slight reduction in the floor area ratio at the base level, and then you can increase it to, uh, under the proposal to 3.75 and then to 4. Uh, as, so, it, so it's 
giving giving you giving it back in ter if you uh, if the development provides certain amenities, and to get to 3.75, you need to, if you were on the on the waterfront of the river or North Mill Pond, you would need to provide some linear open space along the waterfront. If you weren't, you'd be, you'd be required to provide some a pedestrian plaza or a small park. And uh, then you can go to, uh, point four, to a four FAR. If you um, design the building according to uh, lead sustainable design principles, or if you uh, provide additional open space in the form of some mid-block mid uh, pedestrian connections. So that's essentially the, the, uh, the entire proposals before you. It's a, it's a way to try to balance the concern for uh, height in the Central Business A District uh, and really get at the, the real issues, which are light and air and amenities at the pedestrian level. Thank you, Rick. Any questions for Rick before he sits down? No. Thank you. I'll now open up the public hearing. If anybody would like to speak to, for, or against this application. Second time, two, four, or against. Third time, seeing no one rise, I'll now close the public hearing. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, what the department would recommend is that the board advise the department to indicate to the council on Monday that you conducted this public hearing and that there were no additional comments in that regard. And I believe this would go before the council at the 19th? Correct. March 19th meeting. That's where the actual public hearing will be held. Okay. Need a motion? We do. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to uh, forward this on to the council, let them know that there was no comments made by the public at this meeting. Second. Moved and second. Any comments on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed in the chair votes aye. I, I would also like to, uh, as a sidebar, just thank staff and Rick. You guys you did a tremendous job. Uh, really well done. I think the process went like it was supposed to, so thank you. Um, we'll now move on to. You might just want to one. announce that it's, we won't be doing it. Do you want to take it out of order? One, one motion. Yeah. Uh, before we move on to item B, I'd like to see if we get a motion to take item C out of order. So moved. Second. Moving to second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed in the chair votes aye. I'll read it out and then David will turn it over. It's item C, if anybody here is, is here for it, the application of Meadowbrook Motor Inc. owner and Key Auto Group Inc. applicant for property located off U.S. Route 1 bypass, wherein a conditional use permit is requested as allowed in Article 6, Section 10-608B of the Zoning Ordinance to develop the site into a, to include a hotel, a retail building, three restaurants, and a convenience store gas station within an inland wetlands protection district. Said property is shown on assessor plan 234 as lot 51 and lies within a general business district. <clears throat> this application was tabled at the February 15, 2007 planning board meeting. Motion to take it off the table. Do I have a motion to take it off the table? So moved. Second. Moved and second. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And the chair votes aye. David, could you update us on that, please? Yes, uh, this application, Meadowbrook Motor Incorporated, was before the Conservation Commission yesterday. At the request of the applicant, they've asked that it be tabled to the uh, April 19th meeting. And this I'd like to do it at this time because there are some people at home that were waiting to see how this would be handled, and this will prevent some hurried entrances into the room. The department would suggest that you table this to the board's April 19th meeting. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any comment on the motion? No? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the chair votes aye. We will now go to item B on the public hearings. The Portsmouth Planning Board is conducting a public hearing to take public comment on a proposed amendment to the city's 1995 zoning ordinance as amended. The amendment includes the addition of the following section, non-residential planned unit development which would function as an overlay in the office research OR and industrial I districts. Copy of the proposed amendment were on file in the planning department and were available for public inspection. David, I'm going to turn this over to you. Yes. Uh, the board should recall this. We've been also working on this in a variety of work sessions, and this is actually the second public meeting or public hearing. 
This one differs from the prior one in that it has not yet been formally referred to the City Council, so there is no public hearing or even first reading being considered. However, at the uh, last meeting, there were a variety of comments that were received from the public, and much has been brought to this new ordinance, uh, which reflects the public comments. And at this time, we're conducting a public hearing, though it's not required, and we're hopeful that following this, the board will act to refer it on to the council. Um, and with that, I would also ask if we could to have Rick Tainter perhaps brief the board a little bit further as to what the changes are in this particular draft. Also, I might add that this is an ordinance amending the zoning ordinance rather than a particular proposal uh, that a local company is taking advantage of. Yes, it does assist in that, but it was not done solely for that purpose. But that was the catalyst that started this and is referenced in the master plan. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this idea of a non-residential PUD, uh, as David mentioned, has been uh, discussed in the master plan, the whole idea of extending the, the concept of planned unit developments that you've had in the ordinance uh, for open space residential development. And um, several months ago, that was expanded to, to create a new type of planned unit development for affordable housing. And now we're looking at a, at a non-residential version. So it's a way to, to try to be a little bit more flexible and to try to incorporate uh, more uh, site-specific planning into uh, a development and, and get some, some larger scale and, and more integrated types of development involved. Uh, rather than looking at things on a very small site-by-site -site basis. So the first thing, the first part of this, uh, this change is a, a definition, a new definition of light industry. It's a new classification of industrial development for the city. Uh, you, you've got a, a broad classification of industrial development, then you have to kind of uh, hem it in with other uh, classification, with other, other uh, requirements when you're uh, looking at any particular zoning district. So we created this, this definition of light industry which is very important. It's, it's, a, it's an industrial use that works with primarily with uh, materials that are already processed. So it's assembling things or packaging things or, or fabricating things, but it's not working with uh, raw materials. Uh, it's it's uh, something that doesn't re result in significant noise, glare, odor, dust, smoke, or vibration that could be detected outside the building. So it's, it's got that performance standard and it doesn't have any uh, high hazard uses in it. So that's, a, that's the first thing is creating that definition. So then you, then you go and actually create the, uh, the planned unit development regulations. And it talks about, the purposes talk about creating campus style development, providing transitions between different zoning districts, minimizing environmental impacts of development by creative land use planning and low impact development measures, and minimizing the community impacts by promoting mixes of uses that have, complement, that have complementary impact, uh, impacts or demands. Um, there is a uh, uh, de definition of what this is. It's a mix of non-residential uses and it allows the planning board to grant a conditional use permit uh, for, that would include uses that wouldn't otherwise be permitted in the, in the district, uh, subject to the requirements of this section. Um, put the right piece here. <clears throat> so in order to be eligible for uh, the participation in this, the parcel would have to be in an office research district and abut an industrial district. This is one of the significant changes from the way we started out. Initially, we started out with it could be in an office research and abut industrial or in industrial abutting an office research. And it was tried to provide a lot of a lot of flexibility at that transition line. But because of some of the comments and some of the, looking at some of the potential impacts of that, uh, it was decided to narrow it down to be looking simply at an office research district and abutting an industrial district. Um, it has to have no less than 10 acres of contiguous land and no less than 8 acres of uplands. And it has to be served by municipal water and sewer. And I'd like to say, with respect to the, the land area requirement, uh, it's, again, similar to what we did with the affordable housing, uh, the residential density incentive uh, PUD, is that we're starting with a very narrow uh, range of parcels that could benefit because it's really a pilot. We're trying to see how this works. And then we can, if uh, seeing how it works, we can refine it and, and perhaps expand it to other areas over time. Uh, in terms of development planning criteria, it has to, the, the non-residential PUD has to include a principal use that is permitted in the OR district. Uh, it has to have any, any use that has, that's not otherwise permitted in the office research district has to be at least 75 feet from any residentially zoned property. 
any high hazard use, the H3 or H4 use, has to be located at least 300 feet from any residentially zoned property. And all of, the, all of the uses in the development have to be developed in a unified manner. Uh, and the uses that are allowed are any use that's allowed in the OR district. And then three specific uses that are, that to the extent, that are, that are allowed to the extent that they're integrated with and allowed use. And those specific uses are light indus industry, as we defined earlier, food processing, not to include seafood processing, and beverage manufacturing, up to a maximum of 2,325,000 gallons per year, which is 75,000 barrels, uh, we learned. Um, the, um, then there are additional uses that could be integrated with a principal use. It could be a hotel or a motel, um, a, uh, a restaurant that's ancillary to and integrated within the same structure as a permitted use, a gallery or museum, or an arts or craft studio or workshop, and then any accessory uses, customary accessory uses that, that don't exceed 20% of the floor area of, of the principal use to which they're accessory. Um, then the dimensional intensity regulations, uh, this emphasizes the flexibility of what's allowed. There are no, um, in, there, there are few internal um, uh, dimensions, no, no internal side or, or rear or front setbacks. The setbacks are all around the perimeter of the site. And uh, there's a, a limitations on, on structure coverage and open space. There's a description of, of access circulation and parking, which really ties it back to your subdivision regulations. Um, there's a landscaping requirement, including buffers at the front, in the front yard and near a residential district and screening. And then there's, an, uh, there's a review process that takes into account the environmental impacts, the traffic impacts, and finally, um, a statement about planning board action that says that the planning board may grant a conditional use permit for this type of development. Uh, it may deny or it may grant with uh, conditions and that there can be uh, surety uh, required to ensure that any uh, provisions that are, that, are, um, that are stated in the application and that are, are agreed to by the planning board are uh, performed. So that is, that's an overview of the article. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions for Rick? I've got one question, maybe for the public and people at home. When you say 75-foot setback from a residential zone, 75 feet from where? from where the zone line is. So if the zone line runs down the middle of the road, for example, it would be 75 feet from the middle of the road. Okay. So any other questions for Rick? Mr. Coker. Sort of what you're saying, any use not permitted in the office research district shall be located at least 75 feet. What about a use that is permitted? What is the setback? A that? use that is permitted would be, would be governed by F1. F1A? F1A, yes. 50 Good. feet from the front lot line. Yep. Okay. Thank you. No. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Dwyer. Um, this is just a small point, but isn't isn't there a contradiction in uh, the definition of the light industry and how the high hazard is described in Part D? Aren't those reversed? Uh, it isn't actually a contradiction. The right now you have in in your zoning code you. Your high hazard, it's, we've had this discussion about high yeah. hazard uses and we need to straighten it out, but there are different levels of high hazard uses. And so H1 and H2 are the, the highest hazard. Uh, and so right now you don't allow H1 or H2 at all. And Got so it. we're saying. Okay, so that's why D references three and four instead. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It gets into that crazy thing where we have a permissive ordinance. Got it. So it's, yeah. that's how you prohibit it. <laughs> yeah. And what I'd like to do, Rick, once we get the public comment, if there's any reoccurring themes, if you could just take some notes, and at the end I'll call you back if you just, just want to comment on them at the end. So any other questions for Rick? Do you want me to stay here or wait till? Uh, if you want to sit off the side, we'll let the public. I'll now open up the public hearing. If you'd like to come up, if you could clearly state your name and address for the record. I'd like to have first-time speakers get up and speak. If there's any second-time speakers, you can get up after all the first time speakers have been heard. So I'll now open up the public hearing. Anybody like to speak to, for, or against this application? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, board members. Tom Grasso, 35 Wilson Road. Um, I'm speaking against this motion. I feel um, the leniency granted in this non-residential PUD may bring um, certain industries or businesses into an area too close to a residential or other district that may not be desired. Okay. Questions? Any questions on that? No. Thank you. Good evening, 
my name is Byron Robine. I live at 406 Pleasant Street. And I'd like to lend my voice in support of the amendment. I think it would be a, a good addition to our community and the neighborhood as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If I'm out of line, just tell me. My name is Bob Reynolds. I live at 1801 Lafayette Road, Portsmouth. <clears throat> and I'm speaking more or less in the middle. I just think that it's time that the city started realizing what they're doing. Time does not wait to see what happens. It happens. And it has a way of repeating itself. <clears throat> Countries and cities were built on failure. And we are, in my mind, are at that point. We have done a lot of rezoning, building, doing things, and that now we're at the point of where things are going to start to fail. We have seen and know of some of these. An air, for, an air base that lasted 30 years. A federal building that was built, and now we tell, I've been telling, <coughs> we have been told that it will probably have to be demolished because it's outworn its use. Schools, streets, and many other problems, they crop up every day, and I'm sure you hear about every one of them. The city is in jeopardy, and, we, and I have only lived here 47 years, <clears throat> but I've seen so much happen that people don't realize what, that we rely on the boards and the commissions to care for the people in the city. In most cases, they do, but in some, they fail, and that's unacceptable. You have to fail sometimes. You can't be right always. The children are growing up in this city, and if you talk to them, when they get to be teenagers, their desire is to leave the city. They want to go somewhere else. And that's not unusual. We are a migrating population. We all migrate. Not all of us lived in Portsmouth all of our lives. There is no future in unlimited progress, none whatsoever. Unlimited progress will be the downfall of Portsmouth. I myself, I'm pretty sure I won't be around to see it. A sewage disposal plant that can't handle what we have now. And yet every city or town on the fringe is just coming to Portsmouth and we say, okay, where are we going to build a new sewage plant? Are we going to take all over all the island to build a sewage plant? Not a good idea. A water plant already at almost maximum. And yet people come and they want the water, and they should have the water. If you come to Portsmouth and you're supposed to have the water, you should get it. But it's getting to the point where we're going to have to another, have another plant. Wetlands. We are encroaching on wetlands to the point where they cannot work. When you fill a wet wetland, it's filled. It doesn't go somewhere else. The water doesn't go somewhere else. It l dies. And the habitat there fails. And I'm wondering how long it will be before we want to fill up the big bog. Not long. It's coming. Not in my lifetime, but within yours. Somebody will come in and want to put concrete on the big bog. The commissions and the boards have to wake up to what they're doing. I agree that people have a, have a right to build and do as they can, but there should be some solution to the problem of how they do it. Where I live, I've been told that they have a 100-foot, they, they, they included Lafayette Road as open space. There is open space on Lafayette Road. It's between cars. 
An open space to me is something that I can stand in the middle of and look up at the sky. That's open space. I cannot stand in the middle of Lafayette Road and look at the sky. That is not open space. We hope to make this a pleasant place for visitors. So we're building hotels and motels, more than we need. What, what does that tell you? The people that come in for the weekend to a convention or something is here and gone. Our city is becoming concrete. I even saw in today's paper that they want to put red bricks on the sidewalks. That won't help when the people come in the summertime and you see them standing there with a map. And if you're a good citizen of Portsmouth, you walk up and say, may I help you? And ask them where they want to go. And if you know, you tell them. And if you don't know, you say, I'm sorry, I, I'm not familiar with that particular place. And let them find out somewhere else. I live in this city. This is my city. And it's your city. And every time I get up here and I say something about this is my city, why isn't it? I bought a house in 1948 or 49. I paid $14,200 for it. I'm sitting on a gold mine. It's increased $4,000 a year since I bought it. Where else could I get a deal like that? And yet, in the very near future, I will not sell that house. I will demolish it, but I will not sell it. I would not put that on somebody else. They're thinking of building something down on the highway for the uh, circle. I have a suggestion. If you want to see how to do it, go down to the Cape, go over the Sagamore Bridge, and see what they did to the traffic circle there. I was down there a couple weeks ago, and when I went through it, the first time I went through it since it's been finished, Fantastic. I even went back across the bridge and went around the circle to see how that works, too. Instead, what I read was they want to put up about 10 traffic lights like, like they have in Dover. That's, a, that's terrible, trying to get through there. Somebody go down there and take a look. You'll be surprised. It's so simple. Why didn't people think of it? I did read something about they talked about a flyover. That's what they did. They built a flyover all the way across the bridge, and the circle's still there. It works, because the majority of the people that are going there are going over the bridge, four lanes wide. Well, I think I've about used up my time, and I'm sorry to bore you. I think I mentioned the water plant and the sewage plant, and there is a plan to overhaul the traffic circle, which I just spoke of, but it's time to sit back and think, not what we're doing to the city, what we're doing to the people in the city. There's no place to park now, and yet we're asking thousands of tourists to come down and park in Portsmouth. Where are they going to park? Come down to Portsmouth and see the historical sites. Where are they? They're behind red, big red brick buildings and everything else. It takes more than me, and I know most of where they are, to help find them. It's time to start thinking about your children and your children's children and their children, because time has wiped out entire countries. An entire, if you go back into history in the 7th and 8th hundreds AC, you find out that they wiped themselves out by not paying attention to what they were doing to their people. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reynolds? Yeah, yeah Mr. Mr. Reynolds? Coker. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for your very well thought out and well presented remarks. You touched on a, on, a, uh, on a subject that's very near and dear to me as a planning board member. I've been a member for eight or nine years or something, and I, I share many of your sentiments. And I guess fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, there's a very basic premise that, that this board member has to work from, and that is, and you touched on it, every man has the right to develop their property. I think this board actually struggles with that 
because I think most of us, many of us, would like to, well, I can only speak for myself. I would like to see things stay the way they are, to keep open space. But as long as that basic um, right to develop one's property is there, I guess our job is to minimize the, and this may not be the right word, but minimize the damage that that can do. And we struggle with that. And I, I appreciate your point of view, because it's nice to know that I'm not the only one that thinks the same way as you do. So thank you for your, for your point of view. I appreciate it. If I may make comment on it, I don't disagree with, uh, for instance, I know what's happening across the street. I don't entirely disagree with it, but I expect to have a little protection from it. And I'm not talking about some kind of a wall to salt, uh, to wind, to, so that the noise won't be there and so forth. Uh, to give you a good example, I think the last time there was mention of uh, the KFC. I hate to bring them into it. I was with a gentleman yesterday on a bus, and we were talking about, and he, well, basically he said they shouldn't, uh, if I remember rightly, I was at that public hearing, and they were told they could not enter Lafayette Road. They could go off, but they couldn't go on. And even with what's going across the street from me, if they do that, that'll be great. Because I know I'm going to get headlights in my bedroom. And he said they should change it so we could let people out there. I said, the problem is you're not doing it now. And if somebody comes out of there and gets hit with a car and it's a serious accident, they're going to own your property before you're done with them. And that's the truth. When you do things, you better do it right. You better do it the best way you can, because sooner or later, the way the laws have went, they're going to own your property. Thank you. And I can assure you that this board member will be very sensitive to whatever comes in there, as sensitive as I can be to the residents that live there. I live downtown, so I... You know, it's not oh, it's think, not like living on the beach, I can assure you. I think something like that, if I parked in front of this building and I backed out, and there's a road there that goes on the, you think I'm going to go around that building, it won't happen. There's got to be some way to fix that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kathy Hersey. I live at 1761 Lafayette Road. I'm not as eloquent as Mr. Reynolds, but I'd like to speak against this proposed change. I don't think industrial use is a good mix when it abuts residential area. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Elizabeth Stallcap, 1953 Lafayette Road, across the street from the new Casey building. I've spoken before, and I just have a few quick comments this evening. First of all, I know something's going in across the street. That's a given. It's open property. It's going to sell. It will be developed. End of statement, right? But what I'd like to ask you to reflect on a little bit more is changing the zoning as opposed to granting a variance. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is when you change the zoning, it's done for whomever owns that property. Sell, move, sell, move. It's always the same unless they come to you to ask for it to be changed again. However, if a variance is granted to the owner of the property, upon the sale of that property to a new owner, doesn't it revert back to its original zoning? In other words, the variance is gone. Is that correct or is that incorrect? And how can you explain that better to me? Uh, actually, a variance, when it's granted, runs with the property. It stays with the property for whomever owns it. Correct. For however long they own it. The limitation would be, though, is it might be limited to that use, but it would stay there and it could be sold. So hypothetically, if that was a... Uh, a fish factory since it isn't allowed but right, if it was a fish okay. factory i could sell it to someone else who would run it as a fish factory who could sell it to someone else who would run it as a fish factory unless of course the variance that was granted was stipulated that this variance no longer that. holds it upon the sale of the you can't property. do that 
the, stat, the way the statutes are written, New Hampshire statutes, the variance runs with the property, regardless of the owner. Okay. Thanks for clearing but that up. But if the use changes, it could end up going back to the board. So if I had a fish factory and I want to help me, Lucy, make widgets, yeah. that would be a different one. So I would probably have to go back to the BOA for that. Okay. But also I would add that that's not the best way to do planning. The Board of Adjustment is not really there to handle major issues like that. The actual way of doing it is to address your zoning ordinance, your master plan, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. The Board of Adjustment is there to vary what is more unique to that property that isn't shared in common with other properties. So it's a much more narrow platform than what we're talking about here. Could, could you address whether the conditional use runs with the property? Because I think maybe that's the that question. Could be. That the conditional use, which would be granted by this board if it saw fit or could be denied by this board, would also run with the property. It would stay with the property. Yeah. If you got a special exception from the Board of Adjustment, it runs with the property. Uh, basically, it's a property right, so it gets conveyed with the property. Okay. My next question for the board is, um, has the traffic survey been completed? Shall I, Mr. Chairman? Please. We have no project before us, so that issue is not there. However, any development, regardless of what it is developing that area, will need a traffic study and would actually need to go through this board sitting as the technical advisory committee. So you would not see that study necessarily as part of this process but you would see it as part of a development process, at so, least as to the specifics. So what I'm hearing you say is at this time there's no planned, uh, no plan for that property. We're only addressing the zoning. That's However, correct. I went to a meeting where I was shown beautiful plans for the property, where I was shown architectural drawings, and it appears to me that although your statement at the beginning of this was it's not about one specific use or company, it's about the zoning. I think we all really need to be honest here and, and wake up. It is about one specific use. It is about Smutty Nose opening there. And let's be honest about that. And let's not play the semantic game anymore. My biggest concern is the traffic. Mr. Reynolds brought up the KC home and the KFC, and they're not allowed to exit from there. Well, amazingly enough, I'm cleaning the yard debris out of my yard Saturday morning, and what do I see across the street but a police cruiser with no lights, in no hurry, exiting onto Lafayette Road where it says no exit. Now, if my understanding is if they're not on a call, they must obey all the rules of the road. So. If I'm going to rely on the police to enforce that rule, the police don't follow the rule to begin with. And I do have a concern that one of us living on Lafayette Road will wake up to, at 2 a.m. in the morning with a car in our front, in our, in our living rooms. We're talking about people consuming alcoholic beverages, which is everybody's right, although we are all grown-ups and we all know that people consume too much alcohol occasionally. You come zooming out onto Lafayette Road, all of a sudden see someone coming at you, you swerve, hit perhaps the gas instead of the brake, and there's my living room. I know something will go in. I do give kudos to the fact that the plan that was drawn up was nice. My major concern is the exit onto Lafayette Road. If Mr. Eggleston's going to spend all this money on a beautiful access road behind it, why can't we use it? Let's look at Red Hook. Do they have exit and entrance right onto the Spalding Turnpike? No, you have to go in and turn and go around. Why can't this be the same? So I really want you to think about that and look at that, that our main concern is more traffic on an overly congested road. And I take my life in my hands every day getting in that middle lane to go into my home for fear that someone's going to come to go into the KC services. And I'll tell you, I've come nose to nose with many vehicles on many occasions trying to get in my own yard, and I can't because someone's waiting to turn into the Casey services. Go ahead. Beth, before you, your point's well taken. <clears throat> I also live in Elwyn Park, so I'm, um, if this does go before the council, I, I would suggest that people in this show up at the council meeting. I would suggest that if this amendment gets approved by the council 
and comes before us with a user that you again voice your concerns? So the, the user that we're not talking about really already getting his plans in place that we're not saying this really pertains to, but when eventually we can say that he is? Okay. And as long as I have prior notice, I'd be more than happy to be here. Being you're, you're a direct about it, I guess what, what, what I'm saying is don't, don't stop here. Go to the council, come back to us, talk to TAC. Um, th that to me is the best voice versus a, a traffic engineer saying, we're going to put in a 50-room hotel and traffic's not going to increase. I've, yeah. I've seen it a lot. So if this does go forward and it does become, does get approved by, don't stop. I, Trust again, me, I won't go away. I, and, I'm, and I know you won't, but what <laughs> I'm saying is, uh, and I think everybody's kind of shaking their head, that I, too, travel Lafayette Road a lot. I, too, see traffic coming out of the K KC Hall that I was told before when we were sitting here that, oh, no, we're going to go out the back way. So that, that does irritate me on a personal level. So I, I know you'll continue to come, but I just wanted to reiterate what I think most people already know. Mr. Chairman, oh, Mr. if I may follow up. Mr. Coker, yes. Um, thank you for your persistence. I do, I do mean that. Um, you were here earlier, I believe, and said something about that. And I actually asked for a copy of the plans, and I looked at the plans. And in fact, they have the developer of that property across from you has done everything that they told us they would do. Um, so please be persistent and, and, uh, and make your complaints. A couple of other things that I, I want to touch on. Number one, um, and it may be a distinction without a difference, but there is no plan in front of us, and I mean that sincerely. We cannot, by law, discuss a plan that doesn't exist. This board's charge is to deal with something that's in front of, it, in front of us. We all know that that's where this, this derived from. So, and, and I, I somewhat take umbrage with you when you say, let's be honest, because we have been honest. I have been honest. I know where it's coming from. I know where it's going to go in there. But it's my job, and I say this again, as a downtown resident sensitive to noise, sensitive to traffic, sensitive to drunks at 2 o'clock in the morning screaming at the top of their lungs. I don't remember that in college when I was a kid, but maybe that's just a cultural thing. I don't know. But it seems to be the thing to do to scream at the top of your lungs. Um, I am very sensitive to that, and I give you my personal guarantee that I will carry that to whatever application comes in. Can I say right now that they're not going to do A, B, and C? No, I can't because, again, as Mr. Reynolds talked about earlier, they do have a right to develop the property. But I'd like to find some way to keep people from coming out of there, too. That, that, and and if, if and when a plan comes in front of this board, I can assure you one of the very strongest things we're going to look at is how the traffic goes in and out of that place and I think your point about no matter what is put up for signs is not going to make a hill of beans difference. And we're going to keep that in mind because we don't want as, I mean, our, our charge is, is to protect the public also. I don't want to put something in there that's going to do the same thing. Have you ever seen those little spikes that stick up? I would up? love some spikes, like down in Florida where when you return your rental car. You can't There you go. Out. You can't go out, but you can come in. That's right. Don't give up on that one. So thank you. <laughs> Mr. Coviello. Um, do you understand what a conditional use permit is? Yes, I do. Okay, so even if we approve this or recommend approval to the city council and it gets passed as a, as a zoning change, they, there's no property that gets to use this automatically. They have to right. come back before this board and apply for the conditional use permit separately. Uh, you probably know more about Mr. Eggleston's plans than we do. Mm -hmm. I have never That's seen. True. I've never seen any drawing, honestly. Seven, if you want to say. Yeah. No, I, actually, we we avoid that. We don't want to. It's uh, we want to, you know, we want to all look at it as board together, and uh, this be the the only venue that we discuss these types of projects. So it's purposeful that we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure it's clear. It's just b by passing this ordinance, this creates a vehicle for people to um, develop their properties in different ways that are are in harmony with the master plan if you will. And so we're not yet, this board has not yet been convinced that any one site is going to meet that. We have to wait till it gets um, applied for. Okay. All right. So, Thank you for your thank time. Thank you, Beth. Thank you.
Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Mark Allenson. I live at 2007 Lafayette Road. Um, I would like to say that I'm against Smutty Nose Brewery coming in there for a lot of the reasons that you've heard tonight. Um, I live across the street from the New Hampshire Employment Security um, Building, which is also not supposed to be entering on the Lafayette Road. Um, they do constantly. The Casey Home, um, matter of fact, I think bingo comes out tonight if anyone wants to sit in my driveway. <laughs> probably 100 cars in there, probably 50 come out on the Lafayette Road. Um, the state has plans, or the city has plans on widening Lafayette Road to five lanes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I know um, I frequent Red Hook quite a bit. I know what I do when I go to Red Hook, but I have a driver usually. When, or when I leave, I have a driver. People who don't have a driver are going to be asked to cross five lanes of traffic with too much to drink. You're going to get somebody killed, and that's a fact. Um, Red Hook does have, I mean, um, excuse me, Smutty Nose does have plans. I know you don't want to see it. There is an entrance and exit on the Lafayette Road in their plans. Um, the lady before me spoke and said that Smutty, uh, Red Hook does not have a direct entrance onto Spalling Turnpike. They don't even have a direct entrance right onto the main road going into the trade port. You have to go on, go to the lights, take a left, take another left, and take another left. If I'm not mistaken, West Road is only going to be go down McKinley Road Extension, which I don't know if that's a real name, take a left and you're at Smutty Nose. Why do they need an entrance on the Lafayette Road? They don't. Um, I talked to my neighbor tonight. Oh, just to, just to follow up on that, I, Alec McCachran was the attorney who represented the Casey home when they put that through. He knows my brother-in-law personally. He made a statement to my brother-in-law. I don't know why they do that. And this is the attorney that push, pushed this through. I don't know why they do that. They shouldn't allow that. It doesn't work. And it doesn't. And this is the attorney that passed that or got that put through the variance on the Board of Adjustments. Um, the other thing, I talked to my neighbor tonight. He is very concerned. He's elderly. He couldn't come tonight. He's very concerned about Red Hook being close to Lafayette, uh, Smutty Nose being close to Lafayette Road within the, and I think if it's 75 feet from a residential area, it's going to be from the front yard. So it's going to, they can put it almost as close to the road as they want to put it. Um, the restaurant is going to be behind it. The brewery is going to be in front facing Lafayette Road, according to the plans. Um, I think that's something that you guys ought to um, take into consideration. Um, the other thing I, I, that really bothers me when I read things in the paper, everyone mentions, you know, that it would be good, it's next to industrial. No one in the paper or anything that I ever read says that it abuts residential property. Nobody says that. It's like we're not even, we live on Lafayette Road, so, you know, who cares? I, I get that feeling that sometimes people don't care about the people who live on Lafayette Road. I mean, who's going to give us? Do, do we come before you and ask for zoning relief? I mean, is this what's going to happen now, is that we're going to come and say, we want zoning relief? Uh, who, who, who's going to take care of us when we lose, if this depreciates our property value? Does anyone care about that? I'm not so sure they do. Thank you. Thank you. Any other first time speakers? No? I'll now ask second time speakers. Anybody too for or against? Tom Grassel, 35 Wilson Road again. Um, question maybe for Mr. Holden um, to follow up on the previous speaker. When a property does about two different zones, um, office research and or industrial and residential, how does the industrial get precedence to fall into this new non-residential PUD and the resident zone, resident boarded zone is not considered? I don't think I understand your question. Say we have a piece of property that's zoned office research and it's also boarded by industrial and residents. 
which has the precedent. This proposal actually, requires the overlay to be an industrial zone. Actually, none of them have a precedence. So if one board is more than one, that property doesn't property fall into this? A property can only be in one zone. Right. I'm not talk I'm talking about gives, how many. And that zone gives certain property rights. Right. So, for this, example, when that was Ayafola's pit operation and was zoned industrial, right. when Elwyn Park developed, that industrial use was throughout that area. It's this board and this council that actually changed that from industrial to office research. Correct so that you wouldn't have those uses. In the master plan, the office research is designed to be in areas that abut a residential district. So it's the actual district designation that reflects the surrounding uses. And in this case, office research reflects residential. And I would also add that any property on Lafayette Road has the right to a curb cut out onto Lafayette Road. There is no street city street in the rear of that that gives access or frontage so those vacant lots that are out there have a guaranteed right to a curb cut out onto lafayette road just as the owner of the property has an expectation to develop it the role we're doing here is to gauge and balance those rights amongst competing interests and that's the art of it okay thank you that it Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coviel. Are you asking when this takes into effect, an industrial next to OR? This proposal, the way I, I read it, is taking some of the industrial usages and allowing them to happen mm -hmm. in office research. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. Because it borders it. Potentially. It allows but office research and the property that we're not talking about right. also borders residential. Actually, we've changed that. It's not taking an industrial use and putting it in office research. It's an office research use. That was one of the changes that were that was made in the last draft. And perhaps Rick could explain that a little further in his closing comments. Okay. But at one point, you were right. It did take the uses from both, and you could go back and forth. No more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any second time speakers? Any late first-time speakers? Thank you. My name is Stephen McHenry. I have an architectural practice at Four Market Street in Portsmouth. Um, and um, I'm an architect, and I have an obvious interest in development issues. Um, but I've also been identified with this project, as people have suggested. Uh, Mr. Eggleston is not here tonight. Um, but he did ask me to say a few words on his behalf. Um, and it is. Uh, these are comments directed at the zoning issue, not at the particular use. Thank you. And I think that he simply wanted to remind us all that it is very important that we remind ourselves of the uh, coordination of the master plan issues with the des expressed desire of the citizens of Portsmouth in their Portsmouth listens uh, um, development plans, which influence the master planning process and to make sure when looking at any kind of project and when evaluating this kind of zoning that we um, try to make sure that those those goals are in concert uh, and among those goals um, as expressed in the ma master planning outline are to encourage sustainable development to improve the look and function of the city's primary transportation corridors to promote high quality mixed use developments along those corridors to find ways to make these neighborhoods as special as the downtown is and to develop better transportation modes including pedestrian and bicycle access all of those goals are uh, highly sought after and should be part of the master planning process anything that you do to change the current zoning under consideration now should have all of those features in mind. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now call any second time speakers, two, for or against. Third and final time. Anybody two, for or against?
just have a question for uh, Mr. Holden. So you're, you're telling me that no matter what, they're going to get their curb cut on the Lafayette Road? More than likely, yes. And the lot doesn't have frontage off the back to an accepted street. So can the city take that spur road and buy it and use that? There are other options that are available, yes. Would the city, but what, is the the city considering you, that? The question you asked me is, in the given situation, would they have the curb cut? Yes. Are there other options that are available? Yes. Have we gotten into them? No, because there's no project. But to say that they can't go out there is wrong. So, so under that stipulation alone, I am definitely against this project, just for that reason well, alone. Well, don't forget there is no project. Well, but don't please. also forget that whatever develops there. Let's say well, it's Mr. Eggleston, which is in in this letter right here, has spent many hours with Mr. Holden and Mr. Trainer. I would say there is a project. Maybe these people right here don't know, but you know. What I, was going I mean, to the letter says it right here, that you spent many hours with Mr. Eggleston. I'm sure it wasn't talking about um, what his next seasonal brew is going to be. But, but, right, but two different, we're talking two, two different projects, if you will. Mm -hmm. This project here that we're talking about is the amendment of, not the, assuming this goes forward, th there's two projects we're talking, one potentially ties to the other. So what David is saying regarding this that we're talking about now, nobody here, has seen anything because we're just we need to get this through to the council so I don't think you guys have but I think he has uh, on a separate project correct but but as far as this amendment goes you at know. the risk of prolonging this let me also let me put it this way let's say you put a single family house out there its driveway will be out to Lafayette Road yes but I'm not assuming that they're gonna have 50 people in there drinking beer every night big difference So, <laughs> one, I'm definitely against it. Obviously, I think you kind of picked that up. But, Mr. Holden, I would ask how you can remain objective looking at one issue with your knowledge of the other issue. And given that, are you a voting member as to whether or not this goes through? He is not. He is not. He is not. And w when we put this together, and I'll speak for David if you see his lips moving um, we we as a board have have reviewed decided incorporated the master plan talked to the consultant Rick Tainer um, and, and I everybody here with a straight I, I have never seen a plan I don't want to see anything until this goes forward once this is in place I believe it gives us more teeth than what we have now for for applications that would come before that certain parcel that's my honest belief so Councillor Dwyer because if you listen to our last work session, you heard us talk a lot about fish, um, <laughs> which means that we were trying to consider how this would play out in every other place in the city where it might be relevant. I mean, that's what, that's what our first charge is, because this is not only about one parcel. This is about wherever this would apply in the city. So that's what we have to look at first. And then when the when the project comes to us and the site will will begin to address some of the other things that you've been talking about, we do have to and and uh, again if you had listened to our last work session, you saw that we added some uh, requirements about what we need to know about traffic very early on in the project. So it helps us. I think knowing that there's a project out there helps us to um, improve what's here, but. Um, we have to consider how this would fit in a whole bunch of projects as well. And that, that's why it's important for this board not to get too focused on one thing, mm -hmm. uh, but really to consider, you know, what this might look like if a similar kind of idea came forth with, uh, you know, a different kind of food manufacturing <coughs> or um, uh, a foundry or, you know, whatever else might be possible. That's what our charge is right now. And then we'll turn to the next phase of it. So you're saying that although you, you have not all seen the plan for the project, it's helping you to make decisions about the rezoning. What the issues would be in any kind of project. Okay. And that's why we've played out some other kinds of projects as well. That's why we spent so much time last time talking about fish processing because it happened to be a word in here and we kind of played out what would the issues be if 
um, there were different kinds of manufacturing involved. That's why this has changed so much over the last couple of weeks as we've thought about you know, what different uses would be in different parts of the city. So you're saying in, it, on one hand it's actually helping to fine tune what you're looking at, but couldn't it also work in the negative to make sure it's fine tuned to fit? And it's just a question, it's not an accusation. But if, I don't know, if there's good, there's bad. So if it's helping in one hand, could it also become negative on the other hand? Question. Don't know the answer. Could I'll, be rhetorical. I'll spit in real quick. Then, Councilor Dwyer's point, and I was thinking and didn't elaborate, is that this is built for many parcels, many uses. And so there's a big matrix here, not just one applicant for one piece. So right. I'll, I'm sure this will come. Mr. Coviello. Say, for example, there's a property on Heritage Ave. I don't have my zoning map in front of me. Say there's a property on Heritage Ave, all right, that is industrial next to office research. And someone comes before us in the future and they want to do this, this plan, non-residential plan unit development. I, if, say that was the only change we were considering on that one parcel, I, I bet a lot of you wouldn't be here tonight. Because it's not a budding residential, perhaps? Right, exactly. And we're talking our property values, money we have sunk into our homes whose value will now go down given the increase of traffic flow and the industrial use across the street. And I know you speak of Iofola, but let's be serious. All right, well, let me Mr. Reynolds bought his house for $14,000. Let me finish my thought process here for a second. Okay. There's a bunch of parcels like this that meet this criteria. Not all of them might be a good idea to do this. Mm -hmm. We just created a vehicle. We're thinking about creating a vehicle where they can come before us and try it. Once again, it may, Lafayette Road may not be an ideal location for whatever whatever project X, Y, or Z comes before us. We're just creating another vehicle to help improve the land. So if if you said you weren't you wouldn't be concerned about Heritage Ave, you know, having this, mm -hmm. well, let us. Uh, I'm, my initial opinion right now is let us create the vehicle where that could come forward. That's all this is doing. I guess my question is, is this vehicle coming forward because of the discussions that have been going on? Mm -hmm. It was just and the that, start. Of the and that really is our fear. And our fear is our homes. I mean, you all own homes. Do you want to see your home value cut in half? Well, let me add one. And, and, and is that, that, that is a reality for us, that we will lose the value and equity we've built up in our homes. The reason this is in the, was in the master plan was because this area was looked for residential. That was not deemed acceptable. This area was looked for retail. That was not deemed acceptable. It doesn't fit any of the dimensional requirements of office research, and the present ordinance is done by footnote. The office research was designed to abut an, a residential neighborhood so that it would have less impact, less building coverage, more open space, larger yards. The lots have remained undeveloped. If you take a 10-acre parcel, you have a lot more flexibility to increase the potential for development, but also to regulate it and control. This is an experiment that the board is looking at because the properties will not remain undeveloped forever. And frankly, a master plan process can only bring about so many other issues. And this is one of the few parcels in the city that is identified for getting special attention by the board. And they've been asked to implement the master plan and to bring this about. And this is a very public process. And I think the board has probably spent more time on this than almost any other issue that it's had to date. Mr. Coker. I'd, I'd like to address something. Let, let the record show, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm about to make history by defending David. Uh, <laughs> David and I have banged heads for many years on the planning process, but yes, David does know more about the theory of what's going to happen there. That's his job. Um, developers don't come in with a piece of property and suddenly show up at this board with a plan and say, here it is. There's a very, and I will describe it as an onerous process and burdensome process, that developers have to go through, and I think any attorney that does land use work would agree with that, um, probably unnecessarily so, and it's a judgment call, but in my opinion, unnecessarily burdensome to bring a project forward. That process starts way back 
in, in, t in the timeline, sometimes a year, a year and a half, two years. Yes, David has a knowledge of, of a project. I have a knowledge of a project in sort of a general sort of cosmic sort of way that there will be a brewery and, and something else there. We've beaten this to death. And there have been changes made to this since the original proposal, one of which I personally uh, raised a lot of stink about, which was outdoor entertainment. We appreciate that. That's, I would ask in return, please appreciate the process that we're going through. And don't for one minute let up on your participation in the public process. I've always made the joke there's two things you don't want to watch being made laws and sausage, and they're both about the same because it's a painful process. But the public comment has shaped this. It really, truly has. My personal experiences downtown with, with outdoor bands, it, it just it, it makes it unlivable. So please, don't stop. When a, when a given proposal comes up in front of this board, round up your troops, bring them in, go over the proposal, look at it, fine-tune it, look at it, complain where it needs to be complained, remind us of those people coming out of that place and turning left when they shouldn't be, because we will listen. We truly will. I'd just like to leave you with one little brainstorm I just had. The town of Portsmouth is short of field usage for our youth. What a beautiful place for another football field. I'll just leave you with that. And on that, there's also plans in the works to possibly renovate some field space down off of uh, 33, so... Any third and final time speakers? Third and final time? Seeing no one rise, I'll now close the public hearing. Before we proceed, Rick, did you have any 11th hour comments you'd like to make? <laughs> that aren't project specific. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think I... I um, there was the question that came up, uh, Mr. Grasso, I think, uh, raised a couple of points about industry close to residential districts and, and the question about why industrial uses were, why this proposal would allow industrial uses to uh, um, kind of move into, limited industrial uses move into the office research district. I think David addressed it, but I just wanted to, to reiterate the fact that the, that in doing this type of zoning, we're trying, we're recognizing some issues that came up in the master plan process, and there are not a lot of really good choices. And it was it was clear that we didn't want to have high density residential there. It was clear that the continuation of a retail strip along there uh, is not the best idea. When you look at what happened and what's happened to that office research district over the years, you've had the variance that allowed, or I think it was a variance that allowed the the market basket to go in, and that's an office research district that is not what the Office Research district, district calls for. You've got other uses along there that aren't really what is called for in the, in the district or they don't quite fit into the district. So what we're trying to do is trying to adjust the zoning so that what goes in, so, so we don't have the pressure for a variance because a variance is, is really not the right way to do it. The way to do it is, a, is some type of planning process. And, and this uh, zoning amendment creates the ability to do that planning process uh, through the conditional use permit that gives you the ability to look at things on a on a larger scale holistic basis and apply the right kind of conditions. So I think that's just kind of look, stepping back and looking at the intent of what we're trying to do here is trying to trying to solve those issues of um, you know again this is this shouldn't be industrial it shouldn't be um, uh, retail uh, and you know ideally it would be office research but it, that doesn't quite work and so to try to avoid that pressure on a, on a variance uh, this is a way to go. And I think, um, I guess that also, there was another person who asked, the, specifically asked the question about the variance uh, versus rezoning. And I think it goes to that too, the idea of using the conditional use permit process as a, uh, as a planning process rather than the all or nothing thing that you get when you get a variance. I think Mr. Coviello had a question. I had a question for David. Oh. The uh, zoning, does that go to the center line of the road? That was a question earlier, or is it, or is it property line? It goes to the center line. Yes, the center line. So it's about uh, 200 feet, 150 feet anyway. So it would be the center line of Lafayette Road. Okay. Property lines would end at the edge of the right of way, but the district line is running down the center, which provides more protection. Thank you. 
Well, what's your pleasure, board? We can favorably recommend this to the council, and I believe it would go on the April? Correct. The department would recommend that we've spent about a year on this. I think it represents a good planning tool. It's another uh, arrow in our quiver for uh, looking at how we do land use. Uh, if there when there is or if not quibbling on the word there is a project there'll be a variety of public hearings on it uh, but the department would recommend that you favorably forward this proposed amendment on to the council I'll jump under the bus uh, <laughs> uh, I would like to make a motion to um, favorably recommend this to the council I'll second for purposes of discussion any discussion Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, oh, yes. oh. Councilor Dwyer. I was just Question say, on the motion. I think it's been very difficult for it would be very difficult for anybody who hasn't who hasn't been part of um, the details of this process or who isn't hasn't read it a number of times to keep in mind that this is about more than one project. So you know I I would recommend that when it goes on to the council, it go on, if it goes, if we vote to have it go on to the council, it go with a list of the places in the city to which um, it would apply a map of the possible areas that this is relevant to. Because I, I think it will continue to be hard for people to look at this and see it as a part of our zoning as, as opposed to, as if we were at the project stage and I and I think that's really important because I think we're all at the point where we don't know what would happen with the project stage um, so I don't <laughs> I think it's hard to divorce this from more material that goes with it David can we ask staff if this does go forward to provide a, a yes. map a, a colored map for counselors that they it's could actually see. a part you of could it. also leave some out front people in the public could pick them up too, yep. David yep. where they could see it so. I would assume that if the maker of the motion, everyone else, they could be a part of it. Yes. Yes. Mr. Coker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This has been um, probably in my eight or nine years or whatever it is on the board, one of the more interesting um, changes that, that I've ever worked on. Um, you know, a developer comes in and plops down a set of plans, you know, like this, and we go through the plans and we look at them and... You know, that's sort of the routine kind of work that, that at least the way I see it, is, is what this board does. Um, this is the sort of more cosmic kind of um, uh, policy and how do we want to try to shape the city and where are we going. And I, uh, I, I am extraordinarily happy with this. The one thing I don't like is that there is a rumor of a project that will – uh, abut a residential area. I'm troubled by that, but the only thing that we can do is as a board, and I would address this to the board, is to please, if a project comes up in this parcel, that we be very, very sensitive, as sensitive as we can be, to the residents of that area. Um, it's no fun living in you know a place where and I can speak from experience where there's a lot of noise and cars and drunks and all of that so um, I, I urge the board to uh, to be very sensitive to the residential areas that may abut any given project but I will be supporting the motion and um, and I, I commend the board and the staff and Rick thank you uh, for, for all the hard work any other discussion on the motion Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, the chair votes aye. I would like to thank everybody that did come out tonight, people watching at home. Um, I would agree with, with uh, Mr. Coker and Councilor Dwyer that this was an arduous process, and I think we did a great job at, at getting this forward. So this will be before the City Council uh, on the April. More than likely on the April schedule. I'm not sure. April going. schedule. So thank you again, everybody in the public that came out. So. Um, we will now move on. Item C was heard previously and was tabled. Was that vote unanimous, James? Yes. It was a unanimous vote. Yeah. We'll now move on to uh, item D of the public hearings. Mr. Chair, I'm going to step yes, down sir. for this one. I'm going to butter. Okay. 
Mr. Also Co going to step down. <laughs> Mr. Coviello and Mr. Holden recusing themselves. Anybody else that? <laughs> wow. Moving on to <laughs> item D, the application of Stephen and Christy Scott, owners for property located at 293 Dennett Street. Danny Medeiros, owner for property located at 287 Dennett Street. And Walter and Patricia Holt, owners for property located off of Dennett Street, wherein preliminary subdivision approval is requested to subdivide Map 142, Lot 15, and combine it with Map 142, Lots 1 and 2, as follows. Map 142, Lot 1, increasing in area from 7,313 square feet to 14,436 square feet and with 59.85 feet of continuous street frontage on Dennis Street, unchanged. And Map 142, Lot 2, increasing in area from 3,655 square feet to 10,778 square feet and with 28.04 feet of continuous street frontage on Dennett Street, unchanged, and lying in a zone where a minimum lot area of 7,500 square feet and 100 feet of street frontage is required. Said lots are shown on Assessor Plan 142 as lots 1, 2, and 15 and lie within a general residence A district. Who's here tonight on behalf of the applicant? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Corey Caldwell of Ames MSC on behalf of the applicants. Uh, on your drawings in front of you, you'll see uh, three separate lots of record. Uh, map 142, Lot 1 is a rectangular-shaped parcel. It contains currently 7,300 square feet. Uh, directly adjacent to it, Map 142, Lot 2 contains currently about 3,600 square feet, and that is also a small rectangular parcel. Behind both of those house lots is an existing vacant lot of record with frontage on Kane Street. It's a kind of an odd shaped lot, but that is one large tract which today sits vacant. We're proposing to eliminate that tract. In doing so, we're going to, we're proposing to draw a new lot line down the middle. We would then eliminate the existing rear lot lines of the two house lots, essentially adding half of that rear track to each house lot. In effect, it gives each house lot a new backyard, a much bigger backyard. So we're starting with three lots. We're ending up with two. We're going in uh, the re reverse direction of a subdivision. Uh, the lot changes significantly in size. Both lots do. Uh, map 142, lot 1 doubles in size. Uh, map 142, lot two almost triples in size, so the lots are growing significantly. Upon this board's approval, we would set the required lot monumentation as indicated on the plan, certify that monumentation to the Department of Public Works, and provide the necessary documents to the city to move forward with a, with a final subdivision. So we, uh, we're essentially creating a much more usable space for both of those existing homes. Be happy to address any questions board members may have. Any questions for the applicant? Mr. Coker. Uh, question for the department. I don't have my book here uh, to look up the table. Um, but the minimum lot size in general residence A is? 7,500. So, OK. We've made non-conforming lots conforming almost. History. So there's there's no intention of, of ever redoing this and developing these lots. These are basically now, as you say, the backyards. Right. Okay. That's the thank goal of the landowners to create backyards for their for the children. Okay. Thank you. Any, any other questions for the applicant? No. Thank you. I'll now open up the public hearing. Anybody in the public wish to speak two for or against the application? Second time, two for or against? Hi, I'm Marisa DiBiazzo, 144-146 Kane Street. I just wanted an opportunity to look at the plan. Certainly. <laughs> if you have any questions, let us know. Mm -hmm. 
while you're looking at that. Any second time speakers? Did you have any questions? Are you all set? I don't have any questions at okay. this time. Okay. Thank you. I'll call third and final time speakers. Seeing no one rise, I'll now close the public hearing. If Tony's not here. I don't know if we can make a motion. <laughs> I'll step up. <laughs> I'm not afraid of this bus. <laughs> um... Move to approve as presented. Let's see, were there any stipulations? Yes, there were with the uh, three stipulations and would entertain others if so needed. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. aye. Any opposed? And the chair votes aye. Thank you. We will now move on to item Z and F, which I believe will be taken together. I need to recuse myself, so I'll swap with Tony, and I'll turn it over to Vice Chair Hetmanic, please. Jerry, you can sit in the bus. As uh, Chairman Ritchie said, we anticipate taking these uh, E and F together, so I'll read them both and then ask the board for a motion to take them together. Application E, the application of Mori LLC owner for property located at 235 Commerce Way, wherein a site review approval is requested to construct a 23,000 plus or minus three-story office building with related paving, utilities, landscaping, drainage, and associated site improvements. Said property is shown on Assessor Plan 216 as Lot 1-8B and lies within the Office Research Mariners v Village District. This application was tabled at the January 30, 2007 Technical Advisory Committee meeting. Application F, <coughs> the application of Properties LLC owner for property located at 215 Commerce Way, where an amended site review approval is requested to restripe an existing parking area and add a paved aisle to the abutting parcel with related paving, utilities, landscaping, drainage, and associated site improvements. Said property is shown on Assessor Plan 216 as Lot 1-A and lies within an office research. Mariners Village District. This application was tabled at the January 20th, 2007 Technical Advisory Committee. We have a motion to consider both of these, or that we'll hear both of these at the same time, but we'll vote on them separately. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Malcolm McNeil. I represent the applicant with regard to these two proposals. I'm also here with Brad Mesquite of Apple Door Engineering, who have been the site uh, engineers with regard to this project. Having survived what Mr. Coker uh, describes as this tortuous process to get to this uh, stage of completion, uh, this matter has been before the city for a period of time, resulting in a technical advisory committee uh, list of final recommendations dated February 28, 2007. I'm going to ask the engineers to very briefly, because we haven't been here for a while, uh, speak uh, to the nature of the project very briefly, uh, and then uh, speak to you with regard to the outstanding conditions of approval. Most uh, the, the matter that has uh, delayed this in terms of finality relates to the improvements and making uh, public of Commerce Way, uh, and when the engineers are complete, I'll speak to you as to the status of, of that uh, process. Is that acceptable? Yes. Good evening. I'm Brad Mosquito from Apple Door Engineering. Um, just run through quickly on the site plan that we show here. Um, we do have the two projects before you at, at once here. Um, this is being 215 Commerce Way, this particular building, and the proposed building in Orange is 235 Commerce Way. Uh, Portsmouth Boulevard being here, Commerce Way 
being on this side. If you're familiar, the, the hotel is over in this location, and uh, as you go farther down, this would be the intersection of uh, Portsmouth Ave and Market Street, where the pedestrian crossing is. Give everybody a little bit of familiarity. What we're proposing is to put a 69,000 square foot building um, on the corner with uh, 339 parking spaces. Um, we have proposed um, underground detention to mitigate the stormwater. Uh, stormwater would eventually be discharged to the uh, large wetland that sits between Commerce Way and uh, behind the Kmart building. Um, the project that is before on 215 that's kind of in conjunction with this particular project is basically modifying their parking lot and creating a retaining wall between the two parcels. There is a difference in elevation with um, 215 Commerce Way being lower by approximately six feet. Uh, redoing their parking lot in between the projects and then creating uh, the project for 235. We did, as Malcolm explained, um, attend the TAC committee meeting on uh, February 27th, of which we uh, did receive approval. And prior to that, we had attended the February 8th uh, Traffic and Safety Committee committee meeting, which we also obtained approval. Um, at this time, I guess I'd like to step through the, uh, the conditions that were brought forth on the Technical Advisory Committee meeting, uh, starting with the 215 Commerce Way comments. Um, number one re is re with respect to an access easement between the two properties, which Malcolm can uh, explain at the end here. Um, number two was um, that we provide uh, all the existing catch basins with uh, sedimentation hoods. Um, we did propose that, and it is shown on the uh, sheet C2 before you. Numbers three and four are with respect to uh, the reconstruction of Commerce Way, which, again, uh, Malcolm will speak to you at the end. Number five was um, that the landscape plan be reviewed by Lucy. Uh, which was done and uh, has been approved. That basically takes care of the 215 comments and we'll move right on to the 235s. Uh, numbers one, two, and three, again, all dealing with Commerce Way. We'll, we'll deal with those at the end. Uh, number four was uh, an issue that uh, regarding the lighting on the site with respect to Portsmouth Boulevard, which was put under the advisement of uh, Dave DeFosis, of which he had uh, approved at our February 27th TAC committee meeting. Number five was just a, a change in size from the hydrant uh, lateral from eight inches down to six inches, which we have done and uh, have shown on sheet uh, C8. Uh, number six, was, again, was uh, with respect to the landscaping, which Lucy has reviewed. Number seven was uh, adding a note uh, basically putting the operation and maintenance plan onto the actual site plan, um, which we have done, and it's shown on sheet C2. Um, number eight was request uh, that we create a photo log of the outfall um, where it discharges into the large wetland that we spoke of behind um, the Kmart building in between Commerce Way and Kmart, um, just to show the existing condition and, and how it uh, mm -hmm. operates in the future. We had proposed that as well. And that was added to the operation and maintenance plan on sheet C2. Uh, number nine was a request of the fire department that we add a Knox box and master box. Um, we did add that note to sheet C1. Um, the next comment was that the police chief had asked that uh, the building be retrofitted so that uh, they could receive communications interior to the building during the case of an emergency, which we added that note as well, that coordination with the police department take place. Um, that note has been added to sheet C1. Traffic engineer had requested that a construction management plan be prepared. Um, we agreed to that comment and that will be done uh, prior to construction. And then the last comment was that we go to traffic and safety and as I spoke, uh, we did go there on February 8th and had received approval. Um, so that took care of all the engineering comments and the, re the uh, remaining comments Malcolm will deal with uh, respect to legal. Are there any questions at this point? 
Mr. Coker. Just one. Could you just briefly review the uh, stormwater runoff and sure. the, the direction and flow and all of that? We want to, um, are you interested in what's happening existing or just in proposed? I can do either. Um, How about a quick one? I, I, I have both? your existing and in, in, um, the post-development watershed plan. I just basically sure. want you to just go okay. over it real quick. Assume it's nothing here. We'll start there. Existing majority of the watershed goes in this direction. It, sh it sheets over land, gets caught in some existing catch basins here, gets caught in some existing catch basins that are out in the roads. All those catch basins flow to this wetland. So that's about from here over. Essentially untreated. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's over land flow. Okay. It is what it is. The rest of it, there is a high point in uh, Portsmouth Boulevard today that does flow down this direction. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Small portion. Our post-development watershed plan basically kept the same watershed patterns. We've collected everything other than this little piece of parking lot. We've collected it all, putting it into a underground detention area, then to a treatment unit, then discharging via the underground system to the wetland after detaining it. Okay, your, so your, your treatment unit is a? Mechanical treatment unit. Okay, thank you. Okay. This section over here, Collecting it by overland, going through a rain garden, discharging to the wetland. Again, the rain garden acts both as treatment and as detention in that small area over there. Just one, uh, Go ahead. I, I can't find it specifically, but I recall reading in the, uh, the uh, memo that mm -hmm. the underground was no longer applicable. Or am I being confused? The underground system that in this area here? Um, actually, I don't know. It just, it just re occurred to me that I had read that somewhere. Go ahead. I'll, I'll look for it. But, That's fine. But there is, an, there is an underground, basically a piped underground system mm -hmm. um, that we are use, utilizing in this area that will act as don't want to detention. And that's what was proposed uh, all, all along? And By Appledore. That, it, previously, there was a different engineer that had proposed something different. We've come back and revised that, shown an underground pipe system, which has since been reviewed by engineering and been approved. Okay, thank you. Okay. I do think, Don, what you're thinking of is probably that prior one because there were some tricks with that technology that really had to be finessed. Okay, Th that's that probably one. what it is, so thank you. Mr. Coviello. Why so much parking? It seems like there's tons of parking for this building. Actually, it really isn't. Um, really? It, does, it is in excess of your ordinance. The Almost twice. Correct. A conventional office park parking is five per thousand. Um, we're actually under that. We actually don't even meet five per thousand. Most office space users want to have the five per thousand so that they're open to different types of uses. Um, we're just under that. So they, they were shooting for five per thousand. They would actually prefer to actually have a few more. Okay, thanks. Councilor Dwyer. I guess the, the parking was something I noticed too, and this may be a naive question, but given some of the other design elements we've been looking at with our zoning consultant, why put the building in the middle of a sea of pavement? Well, if you, um, if you go back a few years to the previous designs that were before you, they actually had the building pushed farther to the corner. Um, one of the first things that we did when we looked at the plan said, you know, that's probably not where you want it. One, you have a main entrance here in the front. You're pushing it to the corner. You really had no parking in the front of your building. You had it all in the rear. Um, you know, common sense says you know you, you want parking at the front of your building. So we pulled it back. What that did was a couple things for us. One, we had mentioned we had gone to the Traffic and Safety Committee. One of the comments that Traffic had been making was there, when they had the building pushed forward, they actually created a main entrance that came right along the front or the back of this building. What it did is create an offset to your um, hotel parcel across the street. That slight offset is not a is not a good traffic design. They want either to line up or be significantly offset. Um, we pulled it back. We flipped the entrance and pulled it forward, which offset it from the hotel, gained additional parking in the front, which is what you want. And since this is going to be a multi-story structure, you didn't want it sitting up on the corner. It's going to look too big. You want to pull it back and kind of sit it back a little bit. So as you're entering from Market Street. As you come up to this intersection, you're not looking at you know a three-story building sitting right on the corner. You want to sit it back a little bit, just from a presentation standpoint. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Coviello. Um, dumpster location. Dumpster location is located up there. Mr. Coker. Recalling the days of Ken Smith, snow storage. <laughs> and motorcycle pads. There you go. Yeah, yeah, I was waiting for that one. <laughs> motorcycle pads out, out, out in the corner. Uh, snow storage, we have shown in several different areas. Um, again, going back to the parking, since we are in excess of the ordinance, this parking lot becomes an obvious snow storage area, should be needed. Um, you do have some areas on the outskirts and the client has agreed that, you know, should it ever become an issue, it, it does get hauled off site if every parking space was needed. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any more questions? I guess we're ready for Attorney McNeil. One more question. One more question, is sorry. The, the dumpster's enclosed, right? Correct. Okay. Is there a note to that somewhere? Do you have that plan? Yeah, the note is actually uh, Pad and enclosure. As to both uh, applications, there were concerns about the status of Commerce Way, upgrading, undergrounding, et cetera. The, uh, the city's concern was the reconstruction of Commerce Way, what, how it would be done, how it would be financed, and what would be the ultimate uh, disposition of the roadway. The uh, applicant has agreed to upgrade the road to municipal uh, standards. Uh, to work uh, with the city to secure uh, financing for the upgrade, to complete the roadway uh, in undergrounding and the other conditions contained in the stipulations consistent with plans to be approved by the city engineer and planning department for the upgrade. At the conclusion of the upgrade, the street will be offered to the uh, city to be accepted as a city street, but will be, of course, in compliance with your regs before that is done. Uh, we're asking you to uh, approve the plan conditioned upon the city attorney approving the final document. Uh, I'll suggest to you that the, the only loose end with regard to that document has been the security for the financing, uh, but I believe we're now in a position to uh, provide the city with the security that it needs for that purpose. Can I ask a question? Mr. Holden. Yeah. I assume that when this is all done, you would not be opposed to having a report presented to the board to show that that condition has, all those conditions have been completed? Sure. Any questions? Mr. Coviello. Uh, one final request, um, recalling the Ken Smith days. Um, the bicycle racks, is there any proposal for bicycle not racks? not me. <laughs> <laughs> Different department. <laughs> Process. Attorney McNeil on a bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> we had not shown any bicycle racks, but you know, certainly if that's once be a condition, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Seeing no more questions, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the public wishing to speak to for or against this project? Seeing no one rise, second time. Anyone in the public wishing to speak two for against this project? And third time. Anyone wishing to speak two for against? Seeing no one rise, I'll close the public hearing. What's your pleasure, board? We're voting on the uh, 215 or 235 first. We'll vote separately. We'll vote separately. Application E. I should probably know this, but which one's which? Which one's the? Uh, this is the building, and the other is the okay. parking lot. All right, I'm, I'm willing to make a motion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve with the uh, stipulations and the report back, um, and then uh, if I could get a second to agree to the uh, bicycle racks, I think this is a um, a great uh, site to bicycle to for. Um, so I think it'd be use uh, useful to have that. Glad to second that. Glad to second. And your stipulation includes a uh, final approval by the city attorney? Yes. Yes. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Application passes unanimously. Now we'll vote on uh, application F, which is 215 Commerce Way. I'll do 
do it again. <laughs> you're good tonight. Oh, Tony, you're on a roll. Uh, <laughs> motion to approve with with the uh, covered stipulations. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? I assume those includes the, uh, include the other ones with the report back on the driveways and all that, and their sidewalk improvements. Yes. Thank you for clarifying. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, all those opposed? And the chair votes aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you, Jerry. We'll now move on to the final public hearing, item G. The Planning Board is conducting this public hearing in order to solicit pub public comment on a proposed amendment to the Planning Board's site review regulations. This amendment applies to the section regulating applicants' responsibilities by adding a new subsection 6 that requires the party seeking site review approval to complete and submit for the city's review and approval as to content and form a construction management and mitigation plan. Copies of this amendment were available for public inspection in the planning department office and at the municipal complex. I will turn this one over to David. Thank you. Uh, planning board members may, be, may recall that we've had a good number of issues that have resulted from site plan development as to how they impact adjacent properties, how, what streets are closed, what sidewalks may be closed, how you will work in the right of way, who the contact people are, uh, and various issues such as those. What we've done traditionally is prepared what we would call this management plan uh, rather uh, informally, and it's worked reasonably well. But we can see that the pace of development and also the issues, especially of butter concerns, are getting more pronounced. So what we're suggesting is that your site review regulations would be amended by adding a new six under applicants' responsibilities. And effectively what this does, it sets up the authority for the board to do a checklist. So the language itself isn't the checklist, but the language authorizes the checklist. So if the board were to approve this amendment, and I'll read it in its, in its entirety, the applicant would be responsible to prepare a construction management and mitigation plan in conjunction with the site review technical advisory committee and, as appropriate, the planning board. No site work is authorized nor shall work commence before the management plan has been accepted and approved as the content and form by the city. Uh, I believe one of the board members asked what would go into this plan, and that's why you have the pre-construction checklist. I would just hasten to add that's not a part of the site review regulations, but that gives you an idea of what the issues are uh, that staff and ultimately the planning board would be looking at. And I would say that perhaps on 75% of the projects, uh, most of these items won't apply, but to give you an example of one where this could be quite interesting, I would just hypothetically say uh, the Weston proposal for a new hotel and conference center where you're going to have a parking area that is widely used today will become the construction site, so you've got a number of issues that will come from that. So just to give you an idea of what we'd be looking at, and I'm not going to go through each of them, but you'd want to know if you're going to have any encumbrances that are temporary on a street. How are you going to handle parking and delivery? And this would be not necessarily just to the construction site, but adjacent properties. And then on site during the construction phase, where your lay down areas, the duration, can we expect noise and dust, butter impact? And I think you get a general sense of that. Ray will provide an email and express his regrets at not being able to attend tonight, but he emphasized the need for the contact persons, and I think you can see that the way we're setting this up, uh, that there will be a variety of contact information. 
the way the city sees this being implemented is during a construction management plan, there would actually be a meeting where the applicant would meet the abutters and address any particular concerns that they might have. So if you will, the new number six authorizes a lot of other activities and it is the trigger for doing that. And the last thing I would just remind is we're doing this today presently, but with the pace of development in the downtown and the issues that are there, we think we need to be a little more formal. Oh, like two. Did everyone get a copy of uh, Ray Will's email? Why don't provide it and it can pass down? Or if you want, you could read the relevant portions. I'll just take snippets of, this was emailed to me yesterday and I never received it. How about that? Um, uh, in the words of Ray, I'd like to suggest as part of any construction management plan, be a list of contact numbers. Its purpose would be there if there are questions or suggestions to report noise or other objectionable nuisances. My concern is that without proper contact numbers, neighborhoods and or downtown residents would not know who to call or worse, be quick, too quick to call the city or police. Um, I share your belief that if people are given a chance to do the right thing, then most of them will do it. Having these contact numbers will ensure a quick response. Please, please feel free to distribute this to other members of the board. So I will send this along, but this point is well taken on that. So. Um, any comments on the um, site review? Um, um, I meant, oh, Mr. Coker. One question. Um, the wording, uh, the applicant or authorized representative shall be responsible, blah, 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 in conjunction with the site review technical advisory committee and, as appropriate, the planning board. Two questions. One, who determines whether it's appropriate or not to also present it to the planning board, A, and B, what's the criteria for determining that? Uh, ultimately, it'll be the planning board that'll decide both. At site review, you're the only one that can grant approval. So the technical advisory committee will likely be doing your bidding on it, and then you'll be sitting as the final. So if the if TAC gets gets it, we'll get it. Yeah. Okay. But I'm confused. Then why would it say as appropriate? Um. Yeah. Because that implies <laughs> that there are times when it's not appropriate for the planning board to get it. You may find that some of them are so minor that it may be better for whatever the technical advisory committee has done that doesn't need to be played with Agreed. further. Yeah. Uh, John was muttering, and he's absolutely correct. It's flexibility, but all the flexibility is with you. Squishy. Yeah. Like nah. That. Firm. Well, squishiness is with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Hearing on it, uh, we'll open up the public hearing then. Anybody in the public wish to speak to, for or against? Second time, two, four, against? Third time, seeing no one rise? I'll now close the public hearing. What the department would look for is authorization to add this amendment to your site review regulations, and we'll be working with you as the process evolves. Could we adopt it or add it? Uh, adopt it. Adopt it? Okay. I'm sorry, I was reading Raymond's email. Would you say that again, please? Uh, the department would be looking for you to uh, recommend the adoption of this amendment to the city's site review regulations. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I had shifted gears and gone on to the next one. Sorry. Motion. I'll make a motion that we uh, adopt this uh, pre-construction checklist and make it a part of the site review regulations. I was going for a hat trick, but I guess second. <laughs> <laughs> I was giving you a rest. Second. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the chair votes aye. We will now move on to item. Sorry, Tony. Nope. <laughs> well, we'll move on to item three: City Council referrals and requests. Item A. Request to replace this, the community campus signs at 100 Campus Drive with a large sign listing each of the agencies. And if I recall, that was tabled at our last meeting. So do we have a motion to take it off the table? So moved. Oh, Tony, I'm sorry. I withdraw my, I, I withdraw my motion. <laughs> do you have a motion to take it off the table? So moved. <laughs> moved in. Seconded. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The chair votes aye. David, I'm going to turn this one over to you. 
Okay, we continue to work with the community campus. Uh, we're not quite sure how this request will evolve at this point. Uh, so we would recommend that you table it to a time indefinite, and when it's appropriate, we'll bring it back to the board. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And the chair votes aye. Before we move for adjournment, April 5th, do we have a work session? Yes. Scheduled. What time? Uh, what time do we generally go? 6.30 or 6? Six. 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 What are we doing? The first of the month. Seven. 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 Seven to nine. Seven to nine. Okay. And the subject of the work session is? We're actually going to be at this point back on schedule, working with the zoning audit. Wow. And doing something that we've been trying to do for <laughs> the last several months. All right. Good. We'll get materials out to you, though, as we get a little closer to it. Any other housekeeping items? Happy Ides of March. How about the wetlands old, old business? The wetlands? Uh, pri yeah. Prime wetlands update, Peter. Uh, uh, David. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Peter indicated that they're still working with the Town of Newington and with the Conservation Commission and with the PDA, and he expects that there may be a joint meeting pending or will be scheduled shortly. But other than that, there wasn't sufficient information for us to drag him here kicking and screaming. So that's the abbreviated version of it. Okay. Unless Question, please, we Mr. still Clark. have some unfinished business with the designation of some of those prime wetlands as qualifying as a prime wetland, but not being recommended. The last time we talked, Correct. we were going to meet with um, Mr. West, I believe. Correct. And that is the process that is slowly grinding on. Okay. So it is not a Swiss watch in this case. Uh, I guess I'm confused. Why, what, what's the difficulty in meeting with Mr. West? There are uh, not a difficulty meeting with Mr. West. There's a difficulty in making sure, for example, that the conservation issues with it and the planning board issues with it are the same and that we can bring all the parties together and take advantage of that. We're also trying to afford an opportunity for the PDA to participate so that we can keep a general process moving. And that's where it's difficult to coordinate. But I suspect it's coming together. Okay. Thank you. Any other business, David? The height of March. <laughs> move for adjournment. So move. So move. Good night. Hey, Thank Tony. you. Four of